Artist Marianne North was quite a character. Unusually for a woman in the 19th century, she travelled the world bringing back plant species never before seen in the UK. And there's now a permanent exhibition of her work in London's famous Kew Gardens. But her writings also tell another story. Because along with all the colour, the plants and the artistry, we find references to local tribes as savage, infantile and unlovable. It seems for Marianne, like many Victorians, her own culture was the yardstick against which other societies were judged and sometimes found wanting. And this is an example of what's called ethnocentrism. And there are those who claim that, despite its scientific status and research methods, psychology may also have an ethnocentric bias. So what do you need to cover for a good answer to a question on ethnocentrism and psychology? Well first, have a good definition. Ethnocentrism in psychology is a tendency for researchers to use their own culture as the standard by which they evaluate and explain all human behaviour. And a key concept you can bring in here to help explain this, and hopefully impress examiners, is social construction. This is the idea that what we take for granted as normal, natural, right or wrong and so on, is a consequence of how our culture has taught us to see the world. So culture acts as a kind of lens through which we see the world but these lenses vary between different cultures and they change over time. And you can illustrate this with any simple example. So let's take, say, diet. In Western culture it's fine to eat cows and sheep and chickens, for example, but we don't eat dogs. Dogs are friends and pets and we shouldn't cook and eat them. But in other cultures, like Korea, for example, it's fine to eat dogs. People do it all the time. So what we take for granted as what to eat and not eat comes from culture. It's socially constructed. So the statement it's wrong or criminal or pathological to eat dogs is an ethnocentric one. It's not universal. It's culturally specific. But how do we relate social constructionism to psychology? Well, for a start, psychologists haven't come from outer space, although you do sometimes wonder. But in fact, like everyone else, they're products of their culture. And like it or not, that's inevitably going to shape how they see the world the questions they ask and how they go about researching them. So what you need here are some examples to illustrate this. And that's easy. You just need to skim through your textbook. For example, there's researcher bias. Just look at the areas psychologists study. Take clinical psychology, for example. Here, what's normal and abnormal is based on typical Western patterns of behaviour and cultural values. And these ideas can lack external validity when exported to different cultures. Similarly, forensic psychology is based around specific Western legal processes. And developmental psychology usually takes as its standard specific Western ideas about a normal or natural childhood. Another aspect of ethnocentrism, less obvious and therefore really good to bring into a question, is conceptual bias. Think of concepts as tools. So just as gardeners use tools like this, spades and forks and clippers and so on, to organise gardens, so psychologists use conceptual tools to gather and organise data. But sometimes these concepts may be culturally specific. Take IQ and its measurement, for example. The idea that intelligence can be measured through word games and mathematical puzzles is a distinctly Western and even elitist idea. Academics have simply chosen something that they do well to measure intelligence for everyone else. If intelligence was defined by, say, your ability to find your way around a rainforest without a map, or get by on five dollars a day, scores might be very different. There are many other concepts widely used in psychology. Free will, personal and social identity, self-esteem for example, that could also be seen as culturally specific and therefore not necessarily applicable to other societies. But researcher and conceptual bias are not the only sources of ethnocentrism in psychology. Another potential source of ethnocentrism is reporting bias. Analysis of a leading American psychology textbook showed that 94% of studies cited were done in America, while in leading British and Australian textbooks, 75% of the research studies were American. What this means is that in most psychological studies, only about 10% of the world's population is being sampled. And this suggests that research findings gathered exclusively from one cultural context can't necessarily be applied to other cultural contexts. And here it's good if you can bring in an example of a well-known research study that's been replicated in another cultural context. 
For example, psychology students learn that Mustafa Sharif validated his realist conflict theory with his robber's cave experiment, where he engineered conflict and then reconciliation and cooperation between two groups of 11-year-old boys. However, when the study was replicated in Lebanon by Diab, the results were very different. There, there was no reconciliation between the two groups of boys, and the study had to be abandoned. So while we're not talking Marianne North here, it does seem that at a number of levels, psychology can be seen to have ethnocentric biases. However, for a really good answer, you need to do more than define and illustrate ethnocentrism. You also have to bring in a sense of balance and evaluate the implications of this. Well, first, even if a piece of research is seen as ethnocentric, it doesn't mean we put it in the trash can. It can still be valid, reliable, useful and so on within its own cultural context. It just means that its application to other cultures is questionable and can't be taken for granted. Second, it could be argued that ethnocentrism is less of an issue than it once was, as more and more parts of the world are becoming westernised or Americanized. And another consequence of this increasing global communication is the growth of collaborative, cross-cultural psychology. And third, and really important, remember that ethnocentrism doesn't apply in the same way to all branches of psychology. For example, the implications are usually far less for biological psychology. For example, if aggression is linked to the MAOA gene and low activity in the frontal cortex, then this is unlikely to be culturally specific and therefore not have an ethnocentric bias. OK, so let's summarise. Preparing for possible questions on ethnocentrism. Well, first, make sure you have a good definition of ethnocentrism. And don't forget the concept of social construction, it can really help you here. Have some good examples of possible sources of ethnocentrism in psychology. But do it systematically, as we've done here, breaking it down into different parts, such as researcher, conceptual and reporting bias. And also, have an example of an attempt to replicate a familiar study in another context. And don't forget discussion and evaluation. Remember that ethnocentrism doesn't invalidate research, but it may limit its applications. You could also bring in the argument that in an increasingly globalised world, ethnocentrism is perhaps less of a problem than it was in the past. Finally, remember that ethnocentrism doesn't apply in the same way to all branches of psychology. For example, it's more of an issue for social psychology than for biological psychology. OK, so we hope this revision clip has helped you. Why not check out our other revision clips at shortcutstv.com and good luck with your revision.